stage. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, welcome back once again to the basement. This is where we do drums and such. Another drums with Oshin with the one, the only Chris Infusino. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us today, Chris. Thank you so much, uh, so much for having me. Chris is over in Ireland to play a few dates with his band, The Vim Dicta. Um, incredible psych rock band. Uh, you're playing uh, tonight. It, it'll probably be a little bit late by the time this goes out, but you're playing. Tell, tell us where you're playing. Uh, well, tonight we're playing Cassidy's down in Dublin. And uh, are here in Dublin. Here in Dublin, yeah. And um, and tomorrow we're playing Chennai, uh, awesome. which which is uh, also in Dublin. Ah, oh, Chennai's a great little spot. You're gonna love Chennai. Yeah, I still haven't yeah. seen either of these places, yeah. so I'm going on your word. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> I I've not great experience with Cassidy's. I don't I haven't been there uh, before, but Chennai is. I played uh, a gig there recently enough, and it's just loads of fun. Like it's oh. it's dive bar. It's dingy. It's kind of like nasty and dark and stuff. That's cool. You'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Yeah, it sounds like my kind of place. Hi. Uh, so, Chris, you're originally from um, Chicago, Illinois. That's correct. You grew up there, and you're the son of two musicians, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, your I am. father was a professional drummer of 30 years or so. Yeah, that's uh, right. And your mother a singer. Yes, very true. Tell us about growing up in that sort of environment. Uh, it was very, very comforting, very warm. Mm. Um, when, especially when I uh, chose to wanting to, to just start playing drums, like for fun. Because I started around the time when I was 12, because I was just I was bored. Right. <laughs> and so my, my dad, <laughs> I, I think it was like a summer vacation I had, sure. and um, and uh, I just didn't have that much to do, and I was tired of watching, you know, Roger Rabbit for the 19th time. So, of course. Uh, of course. So uh, yeah. So my dad kept his old kit from when he was playing pro, and um, and from there uh, I just started playing the records. Amazing. You know? You know, I had, you know, it was basically his drum set, which was a pro at the time. It was a pro um, Imperial. It was like a Tama Imperial Star kit. Oh, wow. With okay. a Rogers, um, with a Rogers uh, Super 10, five and a half, five by 14 Super 10. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So, so real, real drums from the outset. Oh, yeah. Most kids will sit down on, you know, the 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 shittiest, the worst, you oh, know, yeah. garbage, I mean, garbage sale kit, like kit or whatever. Yeah, I was spoiled. Yeah. I was spoiled to say the least. That's I mean, amazing. But, um, you know, it kind of just instilled in me that, you know, it was always best to have, you know, the best quality gear that you could have. Of course, of course. That you could acquire because it's like I never had a problem with that kit. Yeah. To this day, I still have the, the Rogers. Oh. And and it's just it's still like the more you give it, it just keeps giving back. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And it, it's it's something that's made so differently as well. These days, drums are, are they're quite different, aren't they? They're not made in the same. Well, no, sorry, that that's maybe a misnomer somewhat. Um, but certainly, like there is something about that sort of vintage sound, isn't there? There's something there quite is. different. Uh, yeah, I mean, it really all depends on on how you on how you want to set up your stuff. I mm. mean, um, because. I believe like today is like there's really no reason to not sound exactly the way you want and make anything sound uh, the way you need it to. I mean, that was one of the things I learned from my dad was like, you know, you really only need one drum set, yeah. really, or yeah. one of anything. It's so, you know, and it's really learning like what heads can do and playing with tunings and or if you're in the studio playing with, you know, mic positions and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, of like course, you really of don't need too much you don't mm. but you know everybody's got different needs for in different uh, um like just different reasons for why they play or you know if they're in the session world they get called for so many different things so you know i guess every position is unique but for yeah. me i didn't really need that much sure i sure. found the key things pretty early yeah you find what you need and you yeah. stuck to it stick um, to it yeah would your father give you kind of you know tips would he show you things was it was it very much a scenario where he <laughs> kind of left you to your own devices or or a lot of the time he left me to my own devices i watched him play a lot as a kid yeah um you know he he didn't really start playing a role in me playing drums until i told him i wanted to do it for a living okay and that's when more his business um, ethics came into it and how to run a successful business on your own because if you are for hire you are your own marketer you're your own player you're your own manager your own financer it's like everything is is it's you yeah so um and he i really think probably the best thing that he ever could could have done for me is be tough on me like he he never told me anything sounded good ever <laughs> it, it wasn't in, it wasn't until i like played like with his jazz orchestra and i was like 18 or 19 and it was like in front of like 5,000 people. And I, you know, took this drum solo or whatever and, you know, did that. And uh, and everybody was just like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, we get done with the show. And finally, after like 10 years of playing the drums, he was like, 
Yeah, it's sounding good. <laughs> you're getting you're getting pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> bastard. Like, yeah, yeah, come yeah. on. Like feeling terrible, but like, like the first time, it's like, oh my god, yes. Yeah, it's like <laughs> yes, I finally did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You broke him. Ten down. years and I made you it good in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so tell me about the music scene in Chicago when you were growing up. Did you have kind of uh, plenty to choose from? Was there a lot of music going on? Were you able to yeah. kind of just sit in with whoever and? Yeah, that was that was a cool time. It was. Um, it was in like late 90s um, into the 2000s, and it was still a really cool time. Like I was going to I was going to school. Um, I went to I went to a, a year at Roosevelt University. They have a music conservatory in downtown Chicago, sure. and um, and it was very much like I I started gigging and I started playing in jazz combos and kicking uh, with a jazz orchestra and playing with people that were older than me and mm. that that all different types of backgrounds and and um, perspectives to music and approaches. So there was just this immense amount of information to absorb, rather than what I was bringing to the table, which seems so minuscule yeah. compared to what you know. It's like, all right, well, this guy here, you know, he played with Buddy Rich way back when, and this guy over here, he's been kicking with like the Chicago Jazz Orchestra for like 25 years. It's just like. There, those were the sources. So it's like w when I got embedded into the the playing scene or the working scene of Chicago, you know, it it just was it was very much a job at times, but there was so much work, mm. and it was just like I was working almost every night. And it was making a great living, and and it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I met yeah. a lot of great 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 people. Sure. Uh, so yeah. And what a learning experience as well. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had my ass handed to me a few times, you know, <laughs> by just people that were, that were just, you know, they'd been in, they knew the ropes and they'd been in it. And I thought that I was like, oh, well, I'm the best and I'm, I'm cocky and da, yeah, da, da, yeah, da. And yeah, then yeah. they just come back down, sit on the drums and do this thing. And I'm like, I don't know shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It's got that, it. that awakening to the realization <laughs> that I know nothing. I don't know anything. <laughs> it's one of the scariest things, but it's 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 the most essential part of being a drummer, I feel like. Yeah, you gotta be broken. Yeah. Realizing how little you actually do know is is crucial. It is. Yeah. It yeah. is. Um, yeah. So you, you spent years, uh, a few years, a good number of years in Chicago, obviously, having grown up there. Um, mm. You then moved to New York and, and started doing a lot of session work. What, what fueled the move for you? Well, there, it, was, it, was, it was Chicago. I moved to Nashville for a year. And then um, and, and Nashville was what kind of initially got me thinking about a bigger city. Because I actually, I was only in Nashville for a year. Okay. And towards the end of it, I started doing well. Like, I started doing more records and more demo sessions. And... and um, and just tons and tons and tons of sessions, and I hated it yeah. because I was doing I was doing the same. I felt like I was playing the same song over and over and over again. Right. It's like when you were doing these demo sessions, you would do six songs in three hours, and there was a ten o'clock, a two o'clock, and a six o'clock every day, and it was just and so and you knocked out eighteen, twenty songs every day. Wow! And every one of them was like this, you know, back home country song with a little bit, you know, and it was hard not to go crazy mm. and and I didn't and I didn't do it nearly it's just my my tolerance for it is just lower than than the than the true greats that that live in Nashville like Eddie Bears or Dennis Holt or um you know Paul Lyme or guys like that sure so it's like they've been doing it for decades and and so it's like I you know anybody that's been doing this for decades I tip my hat but um it was just the fact that the music was so predictable to by the time that I played with like my 50th artist and they would come into me and say, all right, now this song, I just, I want this to swell up and swell, you know, and do this. And yeah, yeah. I want it to be really bright and open and flowery here. Sure, and it's just sure. like, okay, great. And, and we'd go through it and I'd nail it on the first take. And they're like, wow, how did you do that? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. It's not like yeah, I've played yeah, yeah. this song 10,000 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually what got me curious about New York. Okay. Because I actually watched a, a band come through town named Rudder. And it was with Keith Carlock, Tim LaFave, Henry Hay, and Chris Cheek. Yeah, yeah. And and um and that was just like, holy shit! Like this is what's coming out of New York. Now later I found out there was nothing else like that band. No, in they're, New they're York. very unique. <laughs> they're very they're, unique. They're very on their own in terms of what they do. But yeah. <laughs> but it it got me really curious about New York. So um, so I moved to New York. I was there for for four years and. Yeah, there was a lot of sessions that I did, um, at least, you know, in retrospect for the time I was there. Um, 
you know, I played with uh, one of the sessions I did was, in fact, with Dr. John, as we spoke Amazing. With earlier. Yeah. Incredible. Um, it was blind luck. Really? It was blind luck. Why? Yeah, because it, 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 it was like, oh, well, these four guys weren't available, you know, and it was just like, <laughs> okay, so, and, and they were all like the top name guys. It's like, this one's out on tour. This yeah, one can't yeah. get into town because the trains are down. This one can't get, you know, is, you know, off working with sting you know and it's just like okay so it's like all right who's the fifth guy that you would call <laughs> hey there's this guy named chris yeah. it's like cool yeah okay <laughs> if you sure. say so okay whatever yeah, yeah so it was yeah. it was really a call at like 10 o'clock in the morning hey can you be here in an hour sure what for all oh, this session going on just uh can you be here it's like yeah. yeah and then you walk in and it's like all right this is what you're playing it's like okay cool and here's the song and it was just the the demo track i'm like okay cool mm. And then all of a sudden, you know, through the through the room, it's like I hear what sounds like Dr. John. And yeah. I'm like, what <laughs> is this? What is going on? Amazing. And uh, ensures anything. We finished, uh, like, the first run-through take. And I walk into the control room, and there's Mac. And it was just like, <laughs> like, yeah. like, I can't deal with this. A bit of a heart-stopping moment, I'm sure, yeah. It, it was cool. Oh, it was incredible. very cool. Yeah. And then from New York, you moved out to L.A. Um, where yeah. You're, you're playing with the Vimdeck. You guys are based out in L.A., aren't you? We're based moment? in L.A., that is correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been in L.A. for a little over three years. Mm. Um, yeah, I met the Vimdicta while they were on tour. They were doing like a stationary tour in New York City. And and at that time, the they were still with their original drummer. And things just didn't work out. Okay. So, um, and I was... At that point, I was doing between like 20 to 25 bookings a week, whether it was gigs, rehearsal uh, gigs, sessions, um, you know, black and whites or corporate dates, if you will, um, you know, stuff like that. And I was just like, I know it sounds like a really big first world problem, but I was not happy. Mm. And and I didn't I didn't like, you know, having this this you know, eternal gunslinger attitude of, and, you know, doing two shows a night, three shows a night, and I have these charts, like these makeshift charts, because I really didn't know the songs. I really didn't know, wasn't passionate about the music. Yeah, I didn't care yeah. about the music. And it was very much just like, oh, well, Chris is great, and Chris has a great attitude, and he's a fantabulous player, and all this stuff. Mm. And so I'd come up, I'd do my thing, I'd pulled from these formulas, and I wasn't doing what you know what i originally intended to do when i started playing drums sure which is being able to convey my emotion my my art is at risk of being sounding like a hippie it, it just really speaking from the heart and being spontaneous and in the yeah. moment and really you know getting back in touch with that it was not that yeah. so when i met the vindicta i was hungry for a band and um i talked to a really good friend uh really good friend of mine and uh, or a couple friends of mine and uh and one of them is in a band that's very successful and um and he was the one that suggested hey try a band and i'm like yeah, oh yeah. yeah it's easy for you to say you know you're 
successful mm. <laughs> and a millionaire. So um, <laughs> so it was just like, all right. But um, and two weeks later, they put out an ad when their drummer didn't work out. And uh, I answered it, and we did the audition. And the next day, we filmed for Last FM, uh, which is uh, the same film crew that films for David Letterman, or once was David Letterman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, and then they uh, they got me out to L.A. Wow! Mm. So that was within a day you were on you were on a sound stage shooting. Oh, yeah. A yeah, it was very much like okay, we really don't have time to mess around. Yeah. So you got to be good. Yeah. And you got to like you really just got to be good. But this is where the experience with the sessions comes in. Yeah. For for being able to very spontaneously kind of get a grasp of a song and, and yeah, because I mean I hadn't been in the I mean I still haven't really been in the music business a long time, hmm. but it's like I've done I've been doing it for about a decade professionally. I've been on the instrument for over 20 years. I played in hundreds and hundreds of, you know, whether it's bands or with artists or sessions or whatever. And um, and so you just learn to always adapt. Yeah. You know, and, you know, those are the, probably the two hardest things for any musician, no matter what the instrument is, adapting to what you're playing on and realizing that you really don't need, like, your stuff with that symbol and that it needs to be at this angle and you need to tune it like this mm. to have your sound. It's like, It's like, dude, it's like, it's like I could sit John Bonham or Jimmy Chamberlain on a frickin' any 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 kit. Yeah. It's going to sound like them. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. know, so so um so yeah, that, that experience did play in and, and the songs at the time were very complex for me to wrap my mind around. So it was like, all right, like you sound good, learn these songs. Oh, by the way, we're filming tomorrow <laughs> and uh see you tomorrow. So they sent the car, come and got me. There was a film crew, and I was in the band. Amazing. <laughs> and that was it. So that's fairly kind of sudden, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. But, but yeah. it's a great thing. I, I like the idea that you don't have time to kind of think about it, to fret about, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm not suited. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I always get this sort of like butterflies sort of scenario. Used to. Yeah. I used to, but then then if you, I don't know, maybe the longer maybe the longer that you're around, if, mm. you, if, you, if, you're, if you happen to be possessing uh happen to be possessing i can't i'm still tired from the ferry yeah, yeah um if you happen to possess the skills to problem solve yeah and to always figure things out whether it's music or not then more times than not you're gonna be okay mm. if you run out of money you're gonna be okay if you get sick you're gonna be okay you know you get sacked from your job you're gonna be okay you will always find a way to work it out. Mm. So with this, I really didn't have the time to be like, oh man, I wonder if this is a good idea. It's like, I, I wondered that after I'd landed in LA, because it was literally like audition, filming, 25 shows in New York, and then bam, I was in Chicago saying goodbye to my parents because I wasn't going to see them for like a year. And then bam, I was in LA, and I'm living, and I'm living in this house in like Atwater Village with my guitar player, Matt. And I'm just like, Shit, I wonder if this was a good idea. <laughs> well, I'm here. You're here <laughs> yeah, now, it's yeah. Like, may as well go with it. Yeah, yeah. might as well go See with it. So. <laughs> um, Chris, you play Vader Sticks. I uh, do. Now, I notice you play a 1A. Um, I do. Why a 1A, may I ask? Is there any specific sort of reason to, to, to playing this uh, specific stick? It feels really good. That was it? That was it? <laughs> it feels really good. Um, sure. I was... I was uh, when I joined the Vader family, uh, Chad Brandolini, who was a god of the drumstick good family, good he's guy. a good guy. Mm. Um, he sent me out a box of of just uh, sticks that were kind of like in my my uh, my ballpark, if you will, and um, and he's and the one A. I just always loved the sound of of playing the one A, not because it's like one and A and it's the yeah, first yeah, and the yeah. best. No, yeah, it's obviously. not like that. <laughs> it was just very much like I always liked the idea of playing stuff that I knew if I was in the middle of Romania somewhere in the backwoods and I happen to walk into a music shop, chances are they would have a one A. So it is so I I I don't know if why that ever made sense, <laughs> but I well, it's always the first stick. You'd assume they'd have the first it's stick. It's the right? first stick. Yeah, it's the yeah. one and it's the A. They yeah, knocked exactly. it out. Yeah. So, but I I really liked the the extra reach that the one A offered because I was playing uh, 24 inch ride cymbals. I have a 26 inch kick. Yeah. It puts the ride cymbal pretty far out there. Of course. Yeah. So and and with uh, the Vimdicta, I play a lot of bell. So. Um, so with um, and even now now that I play 22 inch rides for the most part, you know the bell is still kind of out there, yeah. and I don't like booming my stuff over the bass drum. So it's like I don't use the boom option. Yeah. yeah. So it's very much like how it is here. Yeah. So straight. And down. so I just I love that, but I also love the 
the fact that the longer stick that you have, you have this um, elasticity to the stick to where when you are playing into the drum, it gives a little bit more. So it's not as hard on your elbow. It's not as hard on everything. Very much so. So I always like playing, ex you know, extra long yeah. sticks. Yeah. I like the idea of uh, that extra length and the extra weight in the stick as well. It kind of does a lot of the work for you in Indeed. a sense. Um, Obviously, the, the further from, you know, the fulcrum point the tip is, the faster it will be. That's the, right. The faster it moves. So in terms of getting volume and, and uh, power into playing, yeah. having that slight length in the stick gives you that advantage, that leg up, doesn't it? It does, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think too analytically anymore. I used to be a, a super technician, like playing double bass and a lot of pedals. And, oh, yeah. you know, I used yeah. to, like, worship Vinnie Kaliuta and, and Dave Wackel, and I, I, I think they're fantastic. I think they're amazing. Name check. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, it's like, but I, I, I think right around the time that I started getting called for more records, um, I immersed myself in some of my first drummers, which, which of course, it's like I grew up in Chicago. I, I saw the Pumpkins come up, Smashing yeah. Pumpkins. Wow. So it's like one of the first drummers I saw play was Jimmy Chamberlain. And I'm just like, oh. And there was uh, there was just like these emotions that that like hit me with drummers like him or Stuart Copeland of the Police and um, and of course John Bonham with mm. you know with Led Zeppelin and so many more yeah. and none of those guys were like massive 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 um, technicians at least to me not not as opposed to like Marco Miniman or Thomas Lang or something like yeah. that yeah but um, but they always played like from the heart like you felt that you were always getting them and you do with with dave and you do with Vinny and those guys you yeah, do yeah absolutely it just it just resonated with me more those those drummers i get you i know so, i think i know exactly what you speak of yeah i know it's it's yeah just this sort of the way of playing the way of being it's it's, it's very primal yeah it was it, a very primal way of it's very musically involved they always seem kind of uh, almost uh, overtaken by the music in a sense you know? indeed yeah there, there's a lot of cats out there who would play kind of it would almost be not so much sterile but just they almost look detached you know it's yeah. all, it's all so easy and so effortless and yeah. so yeah it like, just it's like it, it wasn't meant to be mm. this perfected thing yeah. it, it, to me yeah it, you know it's like if you perfect anything then it becomes inhuman yeah. to me yeah very much it so. doesn't sound human i know i know exactly what you mean so yeah Let's have a brief chat about your gear. Uh, you brought yeah. with you this most beautiful Dunnes, Duness? Dunnet, yes. Dunnet, forgive yes. me. Uh, snare drum, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely magnificent. This one here is uh, a 14 by five and a half brass. Indeed, it's a brass 2N. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's his, uh, his vintage brass, I believe is what he calls it. Wonderful. Um, I, uh, for the most time that I've been playing Dunnet, I usually play his... his uh, his carbon steel, yeah, or um, his carbon steel two N, or his cast bronze, sure, which um, which has gotten a lot of love, yeah. But uh, here in here in uh, in the UK, uh, no, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, Ireland. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. Sorry. It's yeah. Okay. We'll bleep. We'll bleep that out. Actually. We'll bleep that out. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's right. We are on the euro, aren't we? Thank you. Thank you very much. I acquired this drum in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's sorry. Right. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. There's I'm sure. Like, I'm sure someone. Like a mob I'm sure someone will Son of a bitch. Chris, is, Chris is leaving. Chris yeah. has got up to walk out. <laughs> He's now. like, "Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> Done with him. <laughs> Done with him. <laughs> I will. <laughs> and I'll drink all the Guinness. Come, come. Um, no, but um, yeah. So it's like I, uh, I, I acquired this drum in England, mm. and um, and it was just one of those drums where I was like, "Okay, yeah, this is obviously amazing. I love this drum." Um, I'm a huge, huge advocate of Dinette. Mm. Uh, I've been playing his drums for years. He and I are 
uh, I consider him a great friend. He's yeah. always been the real deal, the real genuine article. Mm. And I can't say enough about him as a person, and especially him as, a, as an artist, and he is the best. It's, it's absolutely magnificent that this drum is constructed by one individual who just has a huge passion for it. That's right. I think that's, it's, it's something which a lot of sort of industries seem to miss these days, is the passion for the kind of the creative side of things. Yeah. The, the passion for the manufacture and, and, and really artisanal manufacturing it is. of yeah. stuff. It's, it's beautifully made and put together. Yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful drum. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm very, very spoiled. Again. Yeah, yeah, you spoiled. really are, aren't you? I am. I am. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, this it's guy. this crazy thing. If I get this to, guy. I get to play what I love. It's yeah. what, like what? That's just mad. Who does that? Nobody. Who does that? Nobody does. Uh, nobody does. Nobody that. does exactly. that. Nobody plays the, the instruments that they want to play. No, no. They have to. Like, see, you know. see, Chris over here actually wants to be a drummer. He's constantly coming down here, and he's saying, "Any he's nice frustrated. stuff in there, Oshin? Is there? It's just easier than bass. Any nice stuff? It's easier than bass." <laughs> Easier than bass, Chris. Easier, easier to bass than bass. Yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, bless yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, no. Chris. Thanks, thanks. Oh. He's, he's got to go and catch a couple of Pokemon anyway now, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got the app out there. <laughs> let, me, let me know if you find a dead body in a river somewhere. Oh, God, Chris. Dark. Dark. <laughs> This is a good show, man. It's a, show. This is a family show? No, it's not. No, I was going to say, no, we got to bleep out all the swears then. <laughs> no, just, just the mention of the UK. Everything else is fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I, don't I'm so, I, don't God. worry about it. Oh. Uh, and you're also playing uh, pasty cymbals. I play pasty cymbals. Mm. I don't have them right here um, as, as of right now. Mm. I have brand X. Um, yeah. And um, yes, let's, let's yeah the the un from, uh, unmentionables. Um, the unmentionables. What what specifically do you play with regards to sizes and and symbols? Symbols. Uh, well, symbols have changed over the years. Mm. Um, I uh, with the band right now, I actually play quite a few discontinued symbols. Um, so I'm sorry, anybody that wants to play what I play, mm. you got to look for them. That's a, that's hipster vibes right there, that's isn't just, it? Like yeah. You know, with my cup of coffee and just, my cool glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the discontinued stuff, you know. Yeah, I only play the stuff no, you, you can't, can't get, get anymore. Yeah, you're that, What's this straw? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> why? <laughs> they, they, do that in the, they do that in the iced coffees. Iced coffees. Oh, are yeah. Good. Oh, okay, here actually, we go. Here, you can take that back. And there, now but. this is this is why we really did the interview hipster right hipster here. Vibes. Hipster vibes right hipster there. Hipster vibes. Yeah, it, it, it's, that's here it. we go. That's it. I'm not going to put this on Ronan's drum kit. Oh, look at that. See? He's a good guy. He's a good guy. For a bassist, he's not a bad lad. You know, he's not. not sorry, uh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. It's it's only when it applies to to Chris. Otherwise, bassists are wonderful people. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, 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 for for uh, for symbols, I play yes. um, I play a 22 inch uh, signature dry dark ride. Mm. Um, if you're looking for the most comparable thing to it. Uh, that Peisty offers now, they offer the, the Peisty Bluebell ride, which is Stuart Copeland's ride. Yes. Uh, they offer the Rude Rain ride, okay. which is, uh, I believe it's Dave Lombardo's ride. Okay. Um, and uh, that's, that's, it's a far cry from the dry dark, but mm. it's, it's got that heavy, very... It's, it's a meaty symbol, it's a very it? It's a very meaty, unforgiving symbol. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the, probably the other one is uh, Danny Carey's ride, all of them signatures. The, see, the, 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 the true players are trying to tell Peisty something. Yeah. Can you make our ride like the one that you don't make anymore? <laughs> you know, and because we're the biggest drummers in the world, they'll do it. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's just that it's um, uh, Danny Carey's uh, dry, heavy Monad ride, which is the, the purple ride. Wow. Okay. So yeah, those are probably the rides that are closest uh, in comparison. Um, but yeah, the dry dark or the dark metal ride is usually what I play now. Mm. Um, this, the crashes usually vary. It'll either be uh, the rude um, basher crashes or thin cra or um, the basher crash, or they um, or they also have um, crash rides. Sure. And so those are usually a 19 and a 20 inch. Yeah. Yeah. Or I play um, uh, what was the 20 custom collection line, and they they offered. Um, these things called metal crashes, and I play a 19 or 20 of those. Sure. Yeah. So uh, those are the crashes, and the hi hi hats are always consistent. Yeah. The hi hats have been up there for three years. Um, they were prototypes at the time, but now they actually do make them. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is the 2002 
uh, 17-inch sound edge <laughs> hi-hats. And those are the holy grails. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything anything yeah. larger than sort of 14, 15, yeah. 16. Yes. Those things are just amazing. And amazing. When, and when they announced that they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to make these for like everybody. I'm like, yes. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm ordering like five pair. <laughs> um, Done. And then, uh, so Symbol's gorgeous. We've got that covered. Yeah. Uh, your drum kit. You play yes. Q drums. Very proudly so, yes. Yeah. Now, yes. we've got a, a friend of ours over here, Adam, Adam Marcello, uh, who comes okay. by fairly regularly. He's, uh, he plays with Katy Perry. He's playing the Q stuff. Mm. He's, been, he's been singing their virtues nonstop. Dude. Uh, I think they sound, to all intents and purposes, amazing. They are, they are the drums that, uh, that um, I really feel like a lot of the big drum companies want to build but they don't they can't they either they can't or i don't know why yeah but they it's just it q to me oh man to put it into words it's just like they literally took everything good from the last 40 years and anything good that is modern and they just had a baby and they named it q <laughs> because they offer they offer the best of everything they do sure. they they offer they offer great wood drums. Their, their wood drums are amazing, whether it's mahogany, which is the kit that I play back in the States, sure. um, or, or their maple stuff. And, um, but then it's like they, offer, they also offer metal drums. They offer you know, galvanized steel, which is one of the first kits that I played by them. Yeah. And it was such an oddball to think about, but then I played it, and it was warm and focused and powerful. Yeah. And then you know, their copper kits, their brass kits... They're held together by rivets. It's like there's so many things that are like when you hear it, it's like it's just wrong. Yeah. But when you look at them, one, they look cool. Okay, so you get that out of the way. Mm. All right, but then you sit on them and they feel great and they sound amazing. And so whether you're looking for like a metal kit, a wood kit, an acrylic kit, I think they just started making drums in stainless steel, which that's pretty much next on the docket. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, next, that's, next, next that's next. That's going to be, that's the next for me, yeah, is stainless steel. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, between, so Q is just, I don't know, it's what a drum company, I believe, sh is, should be about, is, is well in conjunction with the net. It's like mm. those, those two companies are what drum making should be about because they are all handcrafted. Yeah. They all, the guys that work at Q, there's four dudes. All right. Alon Rubin and Jeremy Berman, they own the company, but they're all craftsmen and, there's no like red tape to go through when you want to order something. There's no like, oh, I got to talk to this guy to refer to this guy yeah. to go through this process. And it's like, and I've been through that with other drum companies. And it's like with Q, it's like I call Jeremy and I go, yo, what do you think of this? And he goes, let's do it. <laughs> and then they just build it. Yeah. Well, well, yeah imagine like, that. Is the, <gasps> yeah, Alan is part owner in it. Yeah. Mm. He's like the Beethoven of drums, man. That he, guy's he's, he's a classically trained violinist. I believe so. Yeah, that's that's something I was uh, I yeah. couldn't believe. I, I, I sat there and watched him play drums and then uh, find out that he's this classically trained violinist. Like, nah, he's not. Nah, nah, definitely not. But he, no, he is. He actually is. He like, actually is. It's incredible yeah. to think. Yeah. yeah, he's he's one of those guys that's just so amazing at everything, <laughs> to where it's like when you when you when yeah. you're in, when you watch him play, you're just like, that guy. Yeah, great. Great. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot. I'm yeah. I'm gonna go play the kazoo. Yeah. Thanks so much. Nice one, Elon. Thanks yeah. for that, pal. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for being so fucking awesome. Good. He's pretty. He's pretty young now, isn't he? As well. He's like. Yeah. He's like ten. He's ten, ten or twelve. So. Yeah. yeah. Ten or twelve. Ten or twelve. No, yeah. I think he's like in his. I think he's still in his twenties. Oh. I think so. I envy Bastard. people still in their twenties. Right. Yeah. Just leave me alone. Just like seriously. I just want to. I just want to go into a hole. Go, in my go coffee away. And play my drums. People in your twenties. Seriously, oh. you know everything. Um, we were speaking briefly about the idea of this sort of, you know, smaller production line, uh, sort of family-oriented business model as well. So you've yeah. got you've got your Q, you've got your Dinettes, and then you've got Aquarian as well. And you were talking Aquarian. about them in the same vein. They they kind of they're able to pay you that attention to give you that sort of. Yeah, I mean, with it, with everything, like everything that I play, I I, I am. Very fortunate and lucky enough to endorse. Uh, so whether it's like with like these little lug locks, like Ron Danette turned me onto these things called um, uh, lockers. Lockers. And they're made by Ga uh, Gager Percussion or Gauger Percussion. I can't remember how to say it. Um, but like Aquarian <laughs> Heads I've been with for 10 years. Peisty mm. I've been with for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, Danette Snares I've been playing for a long time now. Q I've been with them for about two years. Sure. Vader, uh, Simpad 
uh, is another one. SKB, yeah. they're all. I mean, SKB is a massive company, and, and Vader is a big stick company. But it, it's it is very much like I can call Chris Brady at Aquarian or Ron, mm. um, you know, at Danette or Roy Burns at Aquarian or somebody, and it's just it's very much like I have a great rapport with them. I have a great relationship. So I don't need like this ego of like, I need the attention. Yeah, yeah. It's not that at all. It's just the fact that I am really passionate about everything that I play. Mm. Even if, if Peisty went under, heaven forbid, if Peisty went under tomorrow, I'd still play Peisty. If Q had to shut their doors tomorrow, or Ron said, that's it, I'm done making snare drums, this is what I would be playing. Yeah, and and there's so few guys that do embody that attitude in the drum world today. They just want to play what they're going to get paid for. That's it. Or you know, or you know, there's always these strings attached. Or like, oh, I should play this because this is cool now. It's like fuck that. It's like this is what I play, and yeah. if I and the day that I don't play drums professionally anymore, I'm still going to play these mm. things. Mm. And so yeah, it is very much a community, small family. I am with a lot of small companies, um, but they're not like. They still have a world reach. Aquarian got me drums here in in Ireland. Yeah, there you go. Local you know, well. It's like they, you know, they, you know, Vader made sure that I had everything that I needed. So did Ron. So did Q. Everybody. Amazing. So great. it's it's amazing. Yeah, I'm very lucky. You're in a great place. A, a common theme recently is the the idea of building really really solid relationships. Uh, musicians. A lot of musicians can kind of take it for granted. I think. The idea Very easily. That, the idea that, you know, they, they uh, reach a sort of a level on, a, on an instrument and, you know, that's their career taken care of. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't have to necessarily think about the, the sort of the other side of things at all. Well, no, I mean, it really all depends on how you come up in, in the business or how you come up as a person, really. Mm. It, it really displays personal um, attributes when you see somebody, how they treat an endorsement. You know, it's like if the first gig that they got when they were 19 was with you know, this massive pop artist and everything was just like one day given to them. It's, it is in our nature to not appreciate it. Mm. It just is. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, I've seen artists that had massive gigs and, and a symbol company gave them a hundred symbols. Yeah. And the next day they're just like, Oh, well I just sold them because I wanted to make this money. <sighs> or, and you're just like, dude, you deserve like a Royal class ass whooping. Yeah. You really do. Yeah, that's difficult, isn't so it? So it's just, so with me, it's just like if I was ever lucky enough to be endorsed, I'm going to play who I like and I'm going to get to know them. Mm. And my, the guys that I work with in artist relations with all of my companies, I consider them all great, great friends. What a wonderful position to be in. It's amazing. That's, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up shortly. Um, one yes. question for you. Yeah. Uh, kind of a, out of the blue. If there was one groove, uh, if, hang on, I'll try and rephrase that. What one groove do you wish was your own? Do you wish you had played, if there is such a thing? Uh, well, one? Yeah. What's that one that kind of, you know, makes you go, ah. What's that one? Pretty shuffle. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah I, I had to think about it for a minute because there was two that I really love more than anything, and it's it's the Purdy Shuffle, yeah, um, which I first heard on uh, um, Toto's Four record, of course, on the famous track Rosanna, mm. uh, played by the late great Jeff Picaro, um, and um, and then of course uh, John Bonham in uh, Fool in the Rain, yeah, you know, so yeah. but but uh, it's uh, but. Uh, Purdy obviously played it with Steely Dan, yeah, and yeah. so, um, so yeah. There's, I wish that I would have. I, I think I have like my own version of it, but yeah. it's still very much like that's where I that's where I stole it from. And then uh, the other groove that I absolutely love is a little bit more of a c unconventional drummer. It's actually Jack White. Really? And yeah, it's um, Jack White plays this groove with uh, with uh, one of his groups called the Dead Weather. I know of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. Um, and I, I believe the name of the song is Hang You From The Heavens. Okay. And there's this groove that he plays that is just like, really, really? And I can, I'll play it for you <laughs> we'll if have you to, want yeah, to hear it. We'll, we'll get you to do it on camera.
there. But it's 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 simple, but it's not. And yeah. it's just this ballsy ass groove. And I'm just like, oh man. So <laughs> so you know, a lot of times I'll um I'll catch myself singing that groove. Or, yeah. You know, or a lot of times with the Vindicta I'll play a pretty shuffle, so that's why I had to pick Sneak between the two. You, you know who else uh, cited the pretty shuffle? Hmm. Keith. Really? Yeah, yeah. We had, we had Keith here. We had Keith here about what? About a month and a half, wasn't it? A month and a half ago, he came over for uh, as part of his clinic tour, and he did a little master class for us, and we yeah, sat down and had a chat. Rosanna. And the first thing he said was the pretty shuffle. Oh God! There it is. No. There it is. I can't. There it I is. I can't win. No, no. You got there first, pal. God. <laughs> he always does. Yeah, he's quick. He's quick he, off the mark, isn't he? He's the last cowboy, I tell you. Yeah, you reckon? He is. There we go. Yeah, he uh, is. Listen, I think we'll call it there. Uh, Chris Infacino, it's been an absolute delight having you. A pleasure. Absolute pleasure Thank here. You Thank so you so much for much. coming by. Um, really. Check out the Vim Dicta. Great content online. Uh, and you guys are actually before we do go have you any plans uh, with the Vindic Vindicta with regards to recordings or releases or anything uh, right now we're 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 going to be getting into the studio in August and actually recording a cover song and a few of our new songs but um, but uh, yeah we're we're looking to record a little bit while we're while we're um, overseas sure. um, whether it's in Ireland or in England I don't know but um, right now it's like we're we're wrapping up our tour it's kind of like this ongoing thing to where it's like bookings just keep coming in, our name keeps spreading, things keep going. Yeah, yeah. And so as how, a how awful. I know it sucks. Yeah. It sucks that people like our music. Oh, that's the worst. Oh, God. Yeah. It sucks to be in a growing Boo. band. <laughs> I can't believe I have to be on the road with my rock band. This is like it's what a shame. Shit. God, it's so horrible. You could be home playing with your cars. I could be home sitting and doing nothing yeah. getting fat. Oh my God. This blows. Oh, it's such a tough life. <laughs> what are you gonna do? But uh, there it is. Yeah, so we're doing a couple shows here in Ireland, uh, doing some shows in England uh, through August, and then in September we're actually going to Germany. Amazing. So we'll be doing a week there and um, take it from there. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, follow Chris on Twitter and Instagram. Your Instagram is uh, Big Fuse. It is indeed. And uh, your Twitter is, I think, just Chris Infazino, isn't it? I think so. I, I, I really don't update that one anymore. Okay. It, it's, I, I almost run everything through the band. Sure. Okay. But my big, uh, my big Fuse Instagram mm. is very much current as well as my Facebook and all yeah. that stuff. But and, and you, you, can, can, you can find me through the band. Yeah, you can um, vicariously live your life uh, through Chris all over the world. And uh, if you do, I'm very sorry for that. Yeah. <laughs> but I love so. you. <laughs> right. Thank, yes. you go thank you guys for watching. Uh, again, Chris Infacino. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. All right.